Thank you, Hogan. Tonight is a very special night indeed for my first guest. By rights, he should be dead, or at least an invalid. During the 1950s, he was billed as the blonde Elvis Presley, and his mean good looks set the girls screaming wherever he went. But a childhood illness made it impossible for him to lead a full life, and he was advised to take things easy until medical science found a way of making him well. Four years ago, a way was found. The dramatic advances in open heart surgery enabled part of his heart to be replaced, and this summer, a second major operation completed that work. Now he is well on the road to recovery, and he's joining us tonight to sing for the first time since he left hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Billy Fury. <laughs> call you mean, they call you moody, but basically your tummy is shy, is that right? Yes, uh, when I first came down south I had a, a really thick Liverpool accent and I was very, very shy of opening my mouth really, mm. couldn't really be understood and so I thought it'd be easier if I didn't say anything, so um, on interviews and things I hardly spoke and people thought I was really moody. That's like a, a woman called Hermione Gingold, who once said to somebody, I never spoke till I was 17. And somebody said, why not? She said, I couldn't think of anything to say. Um, but surely you, you've got plenty to say now, because you've got a, a very hot and very dangerous and very frightening story um, behind your life now, haven't you? I don't, th I don't really think so. I, I, I think I have a complaint, um, or had a complaint, which many, many people have in this country. And um, it's a big operation I had, but a lot of people do have this operation. I, I believe heart disease is one of, the, one of the biggest causes of death in this country. You've got a valve inside you. Yeah. Yes, I had a valve replaced. Which is uh, a huge operation. It's a five and a half hour job. And um, it's classed as a, a very big operation. To me, it was a very big operation. They gave you, I gather, not to anybody, maybe. what do I mean to you, to anybody? Uh, they gave you, I guess, the, 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 the choice between a plastic valve and a human valve. Yes, they did. Um, when I first had the operation, then I had my own valve repaired, which was caused by rheumatic fever and rheumatism, by the way, as a child. 
I had the valve repaired while, while I was um, sort of hanging around waiting for the, for doctors and surgeons to make more advance in the what they call a homograph, which is a human valve, because mm -hmm. with the plastic valve you have to take these pills all, all the time to regulate your blood to keep it thin, which helps the blood to go through the plastic valve more easily. Mm -hmm. But with the the human valve, um, you don't have to take all these tablets and, uh, well, taking tablets you feel ill if you have to take them. How do you feel, uh, quite honestly, how do you feel at this moment? I mean, you just worked fairly hard there. How do you, how do you, do you feel exhausted or do you feel elated? What do you feel? How do you feel? I feel fine, thank you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm glad you do. Um, what, you, when you went under the, when you were going into the anaesthetic for your five and a half hours, yes. you told one or two close mates that you did not expect to come out of it. No, the, the first, I've always had a, a dread of um, being put to sleep ever since um, I was a teenager and, and I had a, a broken hand and I had a, a really dreadful nightmare whilst being under my first anaesthetic. Mm. And I, I really did think I was going to die. That was in 1970. And um, I more or less said goodbye to everybody in my mind and went, went under the ice. It took them a long time to put me out, actually. You were fighting, weren't you? We? Well, I, had, I was very, very afraid, and I had all the, uh, the pre-med. Then I went down, down below to the, to the theatre. Not the kind of theatre I'm used to. Precisely. And um, no audience there, Billy. No, but they had a great team for us to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they they gave me this other powerful injection, which is the one which is supposed to put you asleep. Mm. And I was lying there on this um, this kind of on this trolley thing, and they were all around with the caps on and and their masks on. And they were looking at me, waiting for me to go to sleep. And it was like trying to put an elephant to sleep. I just wouldn't close my eyes. And finally, I, they were all, all there with the mask. I said, what is this, a stick-up? And I don't remember anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what was the first thing you, you remember coming, when you came around? When I um, did come around, the, the, the sister said that I gave her the, one of the most beautiful smiles that she'd ever, ever known. And um, I think it was because I was very, very surprised to, to awake. And I, it really felt great to be alive. When you, get, when you get close to these kind of things, you get very emotional, well, I do. And when you, when you do come out of it, you feel really great and you feel great towards people in general more than ever before. And you think that will be something that, that lasts with you now for the rest of your life? I mean, obviously something which will stick in and persist with you right? Do you mean a feeling? Hmm, a feeling of um, gratitude. Unfortunately, no. Uh, um, a, f a few months later, after convalescence, you mean it's wearing thin? It, it does wear thin after aye, a while, aye, aye, aye. and it's, it's very, very unfortunate. Whether it's, whether it's due to um, paranoia in general, I'm not really sure. But um, a few months after recuperating, I started work again. Whilst I was in there, by the way, I had about. Um, I don't know, about 50 stitches, and I had these agents in there trying to get me back on the road again. And I just, then, then it began to all fall apart, you know. And uh, I, I eventually got on the road. I did my first week's cabaret, and I got bounced for the money. So that really, um, yeah, really? that really put, put the block on it. Mm. With the people, the whole thing began to come down, and I was very wary of people once again. And are you, are you more wary of them now? Are you wary of me? No, I, I'm not worried of you at all. I've heard that you're a very nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> You've only heard that. I've heard that. I'm, try, I'm trying to find out myself right. now. You went, to, you went to school in Liverpool with Ringo Starr. You, you were in the same school as him. Yeah, I spent um, a, a short time in, in junior school with Ringo. Mm. And um, they were the days when um, we were all using Brill Cream. We were only kids, and uh, we spent all our playtime combing our hair. And doing that, and doing that with the hairs. Oh, oh yeah, we had a to lot do of, that a lot too. of ducks, DAs. DAs, yeah. and uh, the, the teddy boy thing was just about to explode on the scene, and that's all I really remember of Ringo. And until I met him um, a few years ago on a picture call, that will be the day. And of course, he's changed quite a lot since. Mm. Uh, 
He, does, he, he couldn't, he couldn't uh, comb his hair recently. Did you see the pictures of him recently? Yes, I did see the, uh, mm. the bald-headed pictures of Ringo. Mm. I think it's grown again since then. Good, good. You weren't, you weren't a, a, a very good scholar. In fact, you didn't enjoy school all that much, did you? Well, I, I, I didn't have much school, Russell, really, because um, I had rheumatism about six times between the age of uh, six years of age and 14. I had rheumatic fever occasionally. And this used to strike in, in the limbs, usually the legs, and uh, I found like I couldn't you get pained and I found I couldn't walk. And that meant um, a lie-up of about six weeks in bed, lying still, and taking some very nasty medicine, which I don't think worked, but I think that the rest was the most vital. But, but even then, they were, later on in my illness, they were listening to my chest, etc. And all these um, student doctors would come in, say about 20 or 30 of them, and would surround the bed. And then they'd have these diseased hearts in, um, in a kind of a glass dome, you know, in water. What, well, around the bed? Oh yeah, if there was only a child. And they'd start speaking in all the medical lingo, which I couldn't understand. I always tried to decipher some of it, but... Um, but I really got frightened because I thought that these hearts going around were similar to what mine was, you see. Oh and they were all green and yellow. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, there must have been highly qualified uh, psychological doctors as well. I mean, just to show you a lot of diseased hearts. Oh, must have done you an awful lot of good. That was really bad. I hope they don't do it now. I can't, uh, think, I can't think they do. Well, it didn't stop you from being a tug hand, whatever that may mean. I mean, you worked on ships in, in the docks, didn't you? Well, in between Ill illnesses, I, I, I really did feel fit and I... I ran with the, the other kids as much as possible, and sometimes I ran okay. And um, I, went, I thought at first I wanted to go to sea, and I, I didn't pass the medical to be, become a seaman. So, I'm not surprised. So, so don't be a bugger. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so I did the next best thing to me, which was uh, working on a tugboat on the River Mersey which I enjoyed very much. It was a very hard job, but all I enjoyed of this it. All of this fantastically awful medical history, which you've been, which you've been slagging through, did not stop you from, from, be, from making a huge success of your career and making one hell of a lot of money as well. I mean, the, the, you, you have had a highly successful pop career, haven't you? Yes, I, 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 in fact, I did feel very fair to, up until about 65, 66. I felt wonderful. Do you mind if we take a minute of time out to look at you at, at, uh, in, in full blow, as they say? No, go Here's ahead. a piece of film backed by the amazing <laughs> Vernon girls in one of those oh boy pop routines. Don't knock upon the door, don't want you anymore, don't love you where before, well you're gonna make me so, you a fool I ain't you fool no more. Don't wait about for me, I don't want you can you see, well I got somebody new, and she ain't me like We've come a long way since that was shot, haven't we? I mean, all of us. Yeah, looking back on it, would seem so. I mean, we're now in a Mansfield era of shooting pop, and that's certainly not that, is it? I mean, it's one camera plonked there. That's correct, yes. Also, there's some joy in watching that. How do you feel when you see that kind of thing? Um, like a lot of people say, it seems it's so long ago. I think that was in about 19, 1960, which is 16 years ago. And... I look, I look very, very young, and um, I, I think I felt very young as well. Are you honest? I, I hope so. Do you think you're better looking now than you were then? You can only say well, yes. You can only say yes or no. No. Yes. <laughs> you see, I think people like Cliff and uh, Cliff Richard and you and, and then actually get and me. We all get better when we get <laughs> older. When we get lines of experience, there. Don't you think we're all getting better as we get older? Well, I'd say yes. I, I think. <laughs> 
I, yes, okay. Good, thank you, yes. thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, what do you, are you, you're going to start work as soon as you can now, aren't you? In about January, Russell, I'll be mm. starting again. This, um, this job I just had was bigger than the first one. Yeah. And um, I'm going to rest up for, for a longer time this, this, this time around. Will you know yourself when you're ready, or will, you, will doctors have to tell you when you're ready? Um, I, th I think they'll tell me, but, but I'll also know because um, occasionally with, with stretching certain ways, I still feel a little bit sore and it feels a little bit strange. It's like, how, it's like being cut in two and then put back together again. They both feel like different parts at the moment. Yeah. But when it, when it all, all gets together, you know, I won't have this strange sensation. Where, uh, do you, um, where will you go to work when you go back? I'll, I'll go back again on the uh, cabaret circuit. You do have, don't you, enough money not to go back to work? Yes, I do, fortunately. So, in fact, uh, the, it's energy and ambition and, and uh, all sorts of other realisations that are push, pushing you into that. Yes, I have a very lovely, uh, a very great band. You've got a great band here, by the way. Mm. Um, Thank you very much. I have a really nice band um, who are sort of waiting for me, in a, in a, in a way. And I enjoy the, the company and the laughs, and I also enjoy doing the shows more, more, more these days than I did many years ago. Yeah. Well, you've got a different perspective on them now, haven't you? In more ways than one. Yes, I should hope so. Talking about perspectives bring me most, brings me most elegantly to photography, which is uh, a part of your new newish hobby, it, it, together with wildlife. You're into yeah. wildlife. I don't mean wildlife. Yeah. <laughs> although I do maybe mean that, but I mean birds, and I don't mean yeah. birds. <laughs> Feathered kind. Feathered kind of birds. Yes. Yeah, so and you're out and about uh, um, doing a lot of work with wildlife, privately. Yes. What yeah. do you actually do? Do you plough money into it? Well, um, we have a farm down in um, South Wales, which um, is being turned into um, a wildlife farm. Mm. And um, the idea is to look after any hurt or deserted wild creatures. I, I did this once before when I lived in, in Sussex. And um, Where does it spring from, do you think, this interest in, in animals and birds? From, from when I was a child and I started off by collecting birds' eggs and then realised that every egg I took was like taking a life and then dis decided to study the birds themselves, their habits. We've got some very good, and thank you for bringing them, some very good pictures, if we could look at them, of birds which Mr Fury has taken. This is with your own camera? Yes. This, what this, is that one This there? is a, a, a chaffinch, the finch family. This was taken down at the farm in Wales. Yeah. Um, it's nesting in a wild rose tree there. And feeding a baby? And feeding a, a youngster in, in the nest. And the, and the next one? We can, I mean, you took them with your own camera. How far away were you from that one? Um, I was about nine feet, I think, using a zoom lens. That's a curlew. That's a curlew, which or a curlew, as you say. Uh, I yeah, said curlew, uh, you said potato, I said tomato. Um, <laughs> where is that? It looks familiar. That was taken on the North Yorkshire Moors. I, I was doing um, cabaret up there, and, and every day I went out to pho photograph the uh, curlew. And Beautiful, but they're very big birds, aren't they, curlews? Yes, they have that long bill, which is very adaptable. For, they're, very, they're well adapted for probing around in the marshy land and soft ground for worms and other insects. Right. And there is what? That was, That's a, a, that was also on the North Yorkshire Moors near Danby, and it was a black-headed gull colony. Nesting inland, is that? That's nesting inland. They, they, they once uh, were a coastal bird, but they've moved more inland during the last, I think, uh, 15 or 20 years. Why? Well, they find that uh, they can get a good living inland. That's a seabird. A good living inland. That's, That's a seabird. That's a seabird, all right. That's... Um, that's a cormorant, and that was photographed uh, on the Farne Islands in the northeast of England. Do you have to get yourself into any position of physical uh, danger to photograph these things at all? Mm, I don't really think so. I think the most difficult thing is building a hide yeah, to photograph. What's that? That's uh, a tern, which is a kind of a slender gull, also taken on the Farne Isles. It's beautiful, uh, that's beautiful. That, it has slim wings and a uh, forked tail, yeah. and is a summer, vi summer visitor to these shores. One's yeah. common, but... Um, being wiped out by the lesser, lesser spotted public. <laughs> you rehearsed this at all? <laughs> how, how, how many hides do you have? Well, I have about um, th uh, three or four hides, but uh, it depends in what season, say that the winter season I have um, 
a full-time uh, feeding station mm. where birds can come and feed in hard weather mm. yeah. and um, during the summer you can you can photograph at the nest if you're very careful in the way you erect your hide and go about it. Proper little St. Francis, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, it is the most refreshing combination, this combination of somebody who's made a big success, somebody who's exhibited enormous bravery going through what you've gone through, coming up, I mean, coming actually here tonight and going through that, I consider to be a very brave act, and somebody who's, who's gentle and kind and careful to... Oh, thank God's you very creatures. much. Thank you. Thank you for, for joining us, and, and all the best fortune and best luck that can possibly attend you. It's my theory. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.